Jack. My name is Noam Sirkin. I'm the Senior Technical Marketing Engineer for um, Neomon. And um, we'll run through the demo. So um, the way we've got set up uh, the demo today is uh, we've got an, an HC2 um, connected to, to some uh, traffic generator. In this case, it's just a, uh, a simple Colasoft packet player because I wanted to know exactly what I'm generating versus a spirant. It would just generate random traffic. Um, and on the other side of, um, of the um, uh, HC2, I have a virtual machine with Wireshark, so I can show you actually um, the output. Um, we've got a GigaView FM, and I'm going to run scripts from my laptop, Python scripts from my laptop, directly VPN into uh, network, right? So we're going to do a couple things. Uh, the, the very first thing that we're going to do after I log in and set myself up properly with the, with the demo is we're going to get an inventory from FM directly through REST of all the uh, 10 or 12 nodes that I have uh, in FM. So basically, FM will just report back on all every node that it's aware of because they've registered with it. Then uh, we'll just get uh, a specific node that that's going to be our test node, and we'll run a quick inventory on that, see what maps are in it, um, and then modify uh, two of the ports, actually modify one of the ports to be a tool port, um, and then we'll push a map. And once I push this pass all map, we're going to start seeing the actual traffic running between Colosoft and Wireshark. Then once that goes through, we'll run this again. But before that, I'm going to push another map, a map that includes uh, uh, session-aware um, adaptive packet filtering. And what we'll do, that particular uh, flow that I'm using is actually a net flow, uh, a net, I'm sorry, a Netflix flow that has some other uh, traffic. And so with my SAPF, I'm going to drop Netflix. And the end result is what you can see on Wireshark is that before SAPF, the, the uh, packet count was close to 80,000. Once we have SFPF and the flow comes in, Gigamon recogn or Gigasmart recognizes this session being a Netflix session and basically by command drops it to the Bitbucket. We're eliminating it and Wireshark now being the tool seeing the actual traffic, we'll see just under 30,000 packets, okay? So if you scale that up to massive amounts of traffic, you could see the benefit of something like that. I recognize traffic that wasn't there before. I can loop back and say, hey, this is not needed or this is needed uh, and do accordingly what you need to do. All right, so logging into FM, just uh, Sesh showed a couple of these uh, uh, screens, but you know, we have the, a, a whole bunch of different uh, dashlets, what we call, that would show me different pieces of information based on uh, administrator requirements. Uh, obviously, all of these can be eventually extracted through the rest. We don't expose them yet today. Um, so I can you know, look at port utilization, port status, uh, in the whole deployment, excuse me, I can look at uh, port utilization, map utilization. Um, we're actually in this version of 3.0, we expose also stats for our GigaVVM, the, the virtual machine um, statistics. <clears throat> so going to physical nodes, the, the physical node that we're actually going to be using is this one. Um, and uh, what just happened here? All right. So I've got in, on on this particular machine. I've got uh, a GigaSmart uh, blade that we're going to use, and um, we're going to be using two specific ports. So traffic is going to be coming uh, from port number eight, and we can see the stats coming in right now. There shouldn't be a whole lot. Um, and it'll go out through a different port on the chassis. Um, so with that in mind, let me just uh, open up the Wireshark machine that we need, as well as my 
Colasoft recorder or player. And I just want to make sure that I'm on the right. Okay. So there's Colasoft. And let me just open up Wireshark. Second, I apologize here. All right, let's start Wireshark here on the back end, and I'm going to start also the traffic generation. I'm just going to run it back to normal. <clears throat> and start playing it. So since there are no policies involved yet, uh, no traffic has actually been executed. All right. As I said, I have several different... Uh, scripts generated here. So the first one is just going to run me uh, an inventory of FM. And if we scroll up, we can see the different nodes, uh, get their information and whatnot. I'm going to do the same exact thing, but only on a single node. So it's a little bit more condensed and more uh, easier to follow. So I can get here what the node ID is uh, based on the cluster ID. So I know the IP of it. It has no DNS name, so it's re resolved by the IP, uh, 152.50. Uh, it could tell me what the host name is as I applied to the machine, but not in DNS. Um, um, the model, the version it running, and so on and so forth. So the next thing we, we talked about is, tell me what that particular machine has. And issuing that Python script, it gives me actually a laundry list of every single port recognized on the machine, what their status, what the status is, uh, if it's a type of network or a type of uh, tool, uh, if it has SFP in it, and if it does, then what type of SFP it is, um, and so on and so forth. The next thing that we're going to do is ask for the current MEPS. Now, I know this is all manually done, but if you think about a REST consumer like JDSU, um, like um, Splunk, like, you know, you name it, any tool that has REST capabilities, even ACI, I had a, a very interesting conversation yesterday with uh, some of the guys from ACI, right, where we see some type of traffic, and, and then as long as the logic is built into the tool, the tool recognizes this and says, oh, wait, this is not normal, or this is not what I'm expecting. What I want to do now is just get a, a, a deeper visibility into this, or maybe actually just drop it completely, because I know this is traffic that is not um, critical to the business. So there's no need to send it to the tools. So I'm getting... The, the list of maps, and um, it just, again, it's, it's, it's very structured. So unlike a CLI scrub, where if I make, from a Gigamon perspective, I make some changes in my CLI, my scripts break. With a JSON format that is machine readable, and it's human to an extent readable, right? I know exactly what to expect and how my script as well as the result of that script should comply with. All right, let me um, just make sure that my 
Yep, and it's sure stopped. As I said, uh, close to 80,000 packets. You could see it, uh, 79, 917. So I'm just gonna run uh, this once more because now we're ready to actually execute the script um, that would pass traffic. And as soon as that is pushed in, my traffic flows. Again, take this to a real scenario where traffic is already flowing. I recognize something different, something that is uh, of interest to me, something that might be needed to be redirected to a different tool. I can do that. Um, again, so we're going to add now the session aware APF. Um, and just for the sake of, of completeness, let me stop and just run it faster so you can actually see the packets coming in uh, after SFP, uh, after, sorry, session aware um, um, APF, and the number of packets is gonna be much smaller than what we had before. Um, as we're doing this, I'm now just displaying those three new maps that we've created for the sake of filtering out Netflix. And, and again, APF is such a powerful tool. Using regex, I can pretty much tell it what is it that I'm matching on. So in this case, several different terms that identify Netflix. But it could be pretty much any streaming media that we know the protocol of it we can dump, right? As long as it doesn't match as something that is critical for us, right? I mean, um, you know, maybe, maybe Skype in an, or, in an organization is important, uh, whereas for somebody else, Skype isn't because they're using uh, real VoIP, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, Cisco VoIP, Cisco VoIP. Um, it, it could be, um, eliminating, or actually it could be with, SA, with SA, uh, um, session aware of APF, I can identify SSL traffic that is running on um, non-predetermined port. So instead of looking for 443, I can say, okay, well, just look for the client hello. And when you see the client hello, that would be an SSL traffic. Send it to some tool for SSL uh, not necessarily decryption, because you have to have the, the certificate for it, but I could hold that traffic for a little bit longer and see uh, what else comes, right? I mean, a lot of malware would pretend to be SSL. So if you see a SSL that doesn't belong to you, why not redirect it to, say, FireEye and let FireEye deal with it and figure out, right? Yes? So on, the, the value, so on your rules, under the value uh, flags, what, what, what is that matching against? Is that a, is that a flag that, that um, Gigam on the tools putting on it? Or why are no. there so many different flags? Uh, um, you're talking about this, yeah. the value? So the flag that I'm looking for is a, a pattern match. It's just because it was in the packet itself? It's in the packet. Okay. So the packet, it, it's somewhere in the header of the packet. I'm sorry, not in the header, but in the payload of the packet, right? Either the URL or data descriptor or something would have either Netflix or uh, NFLX video or something like that. So I know that is Netflix. And um, actually, let me stop because the traffic has stopped. So I've got um, almost 80K packets, but what the tool actually sees is just about 27,000. So everything that was Netflix was eliminated from the tool. The alternative is not very pleasant for, from a customer perspective. It's great for the tool vendors, right? Spend another million and a half to buy another Dynatrace because you need the capacity. So the blocking of Netflix is happening on the Gigamon fabric and it's not actually being applied to any of the network infrastructure. That's right. Think about this hospital setting 
or any anywhere where you have customers, guest net, bank, right? You want to provide them the time. When, when I'm in the branch and waiting for the next available teller, I want to do my own thing, whether it's watching a video or listening to music or anything. Is that business critical to Bank of America, to Marriott, to Good Sam in San Jose? No. So why do I need to send that to my tools? So, uh, <coughs> that's what... Why would you even allow them? <laughs> because I've got patients. Yeah. I've got customers. I want to provide the best customer service I can, which includes these type of services. With QoS enabled to a reasonable degree. Yes. I, I'm not, this is not in replacement or in lieu of, of proper QoS. This is about my tool infrastructure. I have to comply with, with FCC. I have to comply with, with HIPAA. I have to comply with PCI and all that. That doesn't mean that Netflix traffic has to be stored on my Giga store. Okay. It just takes tra space. Yeah, I think part of what was confusing. Me. So, our, so normally, you know, our our primary tools, we, we have some analytics, you know, web analytics mm -hmm. tools, and we also have a lot of security tools. Right. And the security guys always want to see everything. Yeah. So right. it's kind of like, why would you not send them traffic? But it, is it is it? I, I guess a part of it's going to be uh, compliance, or or the tool the, the tool itself can can only accept so much and do it analytics against only so much traffic, but. Um, for, I guess for the security appliance, like, so is, is the point more to uh, manage how much traffic you're sending to those tools and, and, and to be more selective and granular in what traffic you're sending them? It's being granular and selective, one. It's also being able to control what traffic goes where and what traffic has to go nowhere. Yes, for, secu for specific security tools, you might want to send everything. For other, for other tools, you may not want to send what is not important, what isn't necessarily on right your network. And for these, these Python scripts, do you already have them predefined? Are they easily adjusted? Or is somebody responsible for learning how to code with Python? Do you have a GitHub repository? Of uh, we have a, a, a VMware chatter that we're building up. Um, GitHub is, is going to be a good idea, too. Uh, but we do have some scripts that we've built internally and we're exposing them to customers. Um, you know, if you know Python, you know what to do. And in my case, I'm just... We have a customer portal on which these people... So what I missed two questions. Um, one was um, in terms of why would we want to do this. Well, actually, let me start with your question first. Let's affect the production network. Remember, the visibility fabric is out of band. Okay. Right? There are many use cases for Eline as well. Everything that he's talking about today and what we've shown today is about out of band. It means there's no effect at all in the production network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, it's just uh, tuning what you're actually listening exactly. to. Yeah. Yes. Now, the second one is, why would we want to do this? Remember that typically, typical IT infrastructure often, as you know, has got lots of tools. And the kind of traffic that a voice over IP analysis tool is looking for is very different from what you know a forensics recorder, for example, is looking at. The Video traffic example is particularly pertinent when you're looking at um, saving, for example, storage space. Why would I want to go have a packet recorder start, you know, clogging up because of Netflix traffic or YouTube traffic going there? So those are examples where you can actually get much more business value because rather than recording for, let's say, seven days, you can probably do it for 30 days. I think, so to me, the biggest question I have is that we already do this, right? So you already have a bunch of knobs and widgets that you can do, and you send certain traffic to tools. And we kind of already do that. It's more static in nature. This is more dynamic in nature. Absolutely. And so I'm just trying to think through the dynamic of it, is when, wh what tools would I use? Because my web analytics tools, I send all the web traffic to. The web guy, the, 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 the e-commerce guys are going to want all the web traffic all the time, right. and they're not going to want anything but web traffic all the time. So that's what I send to them. It's kind of static. The security guys want everything all the time, so I just send them everything all the time. Um, I, I, but I guess there are probably more tools that are maybe a little bit more dynamic in nature. And if your IPS is limited to six gigs a second, right, and then and then you want to direct certain flows to it and be more dynamic in that nature, I get that too. Is that is that kind of don't get hung up on on the fact that I eliminated traffic here. Think about it, you know. Let's reverse it. Instead of eliminating Netflix traffic, let's think about maybe SSL traffic. SSL traffic that you don't have the cert for. Okay, so let's identify that search traffic, but instead of sending it to my normal tool where, where my 
traffic resides and analyzed, let's send it to, to some other port where you have just a generic network recorder. So later on, you could do your analysis. Maybe you could do you know, brute force decryption of, of that traffic if you can. But you keep it separately because it's not necessarily yours. Okay, and, and like that, you could have many different tools and, and, and rules on what traffic goes where, and I can very dynamically, I mean, you saw how long it took me to push a script and we've got the traffic running, right? Or stopping, or the map no longer is needed, I can push a, a destroy command on it, a delete. Two other examples I would give is, um, um, I think you spoke briefly about the SSL traffic, right? Yeah. So normally you expect that on a standard port, 440. What if you suddenly start seeing SSL traffic on a tool port, on a non-standard port, and there's kind of uh, activity going on there that you want to understand what's going on. It may not be malicious, but you want to understand as an administrator what's going on. A classic example where you could program the visibility fabric, assume the search are loaded in the visibility fabric, to decrypt it and send it to it. The second example... Or create NetFlow for it, right? Yeah. You, you, could, you could, for that particular SSL traffic, you, you know what, you're not going to look into the payload, but you look at who's talking to who, for how long, has that been a repetitive pattern, you know, you can do that with the fabric now. Talking about NetFlow, and the classic example is, imagine remote site management, right? Typically you've got low speed band links to which it's connected to a central site. <coughs> so you can be having NetFlow records being generated from the remote site, I mean, to see certain things that are observed in the NetFlow record, that may warrant a further, you know, full flow capture to be done from the remote side. Now, if you were to be doing it manually, it's probably too slow for anything, you know, to meaningful to really be captured. So, yeah, it looks like you had a comment on that. Yeah, the other scenario that we've spoken with a number of our accounts about is, a lot of times you'll slice all the frames, right? So you're only interested in the headers of information, either because there's encrypted payload or because the payload just isn't relevant for your analysis. But as you start to see certain flows or certain applications begin to degrade, you want to be able to capture the entirety of those frames in order to be able to have the context of what was being requested, what SQL select command was being issued, why is it that suddenly we started to degrade performance where we weren't before. So we try to extend the, the overall resources available inside of the tool by looking only at header information, but then when an issue is identified, we want to automatically drill down and get all of the context and all of the payload. The problem again is that that's a very manual process. Somebody would have to recognize that there's degradation, then go into the tool, make the modifications and so forth. With the API integration uh, between the Observer platform and Gigamon, the tool can make that decision and say, I've, I've identified degradation, now I'm going to ensure that my users will eventually consume the information and KPIs that Observer is generating, have all the information possible. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I can see that. I think perhaps my, my environment is a little more static than because you know the likelihood of us using a lot of these features and that that very dynamic nature, but it, it, it's good to have the tools. And another thing too is that they have the capability. A lot of times you find use cases you didn't know existed because you didn't have the capability before. You never thought through the use cases. A, a last use case I can think of, right? ACI. ACI has that dynamic capability to it, right? So as you bring up new payloads within ACI, uh, we're, we're exploring at least uh, uh, now, how would ACI send out something to FM to say, hey, there are new payloads coming up, you know, let's do something to trap that traffic as well. So, you know, the, the other question I have is like, we're, so we're talking to other vendors, uh, Big Switch, Big Tap, Arista Dan's, uh, Nexus Data Broker, these, these, uh, so the, the, the big elephant in the room for me is, the packet broker business in general, right? And so this, a lot of this dynamic is, is capable with other SDN tools where I can start to more intelligently tap out of my, uh, uh, you know, orchestrated network fabrics. And that's a whole nother topic perhaps. But, um, you know, we're, just is in general, where do you see that guy, you guys fitting in in that new world? And, and what's, what's, your, what's your kind of roadmap and what's your, your feel on that? I guess the question to ask is where do those guys fit in? Okay, first of all, remember we created this market. We've been in this space for about 11 years. Mm -hmm. So we are defining the space of visibility, right? What you have to understand is that switches are meant for forwarding. They're really good 
switches our routers for that matter, are really good in taking data from one location, sending to another location. So you can use a certain set of capabilities for doing monitoring. But the problem with all the switching vendors, or routing vendors for that matter, is that they look at it from the perspective of, I need to attack multiple locations and send the traffic. Nobody talks about intelligence. So the whole purpose of visibility is in terms of how much intelligence can you have before it is delivered to the tools. Right? If you just take more firewalls of traffic from here, sending it there, there's no value being added there. Right? And consider this. The market is actually voting with its wallet to have more and more traffic intelligence in visibility. And we see that all the time because we've got commodity nodes which are basically ways to extend the reach of the fabric. Right? So if you look at this, uh, these are basically the, the TA series is an, is an abbreviation for traffic aggregation, right? Um, so essentially it's a way to grab traffic from multiple locations in, in the infrastructure. That's on the physical side and of course you also have the virtual one. Um, so you can do essential elements such as the flow selection or flow mapping for standard tuples, things like layer 2 to layer 4. You can define user-defined filters and anything that's there in the first specific bytes of the header you know, you can do that. That's basically what switching vendors can do. Right? Mm -hmm. None of this traffic intelligence can be done. SSL decryption, no. Net flow, absolutely no. Yeah, some people do S flow. S flow is like a poor mass net flow. Right? So if you're using it for application performance management on a van, that's perfectly fine. If you're using it for security, really bad idea. Right? If you're taking, you know, like a sampling of 1 in 1024, are you really going to be using it for security? It's like having a camera in your home that takes a picture every 10 minutes or so. What happens in between books? Right? So it's a lot of value that you need to understand in terms of why high fidelity net flow is so important in infrastructure, especially for security purposes. And in our customer base, as well as more and more, we are seeing the adoption of this exceed, if not close to 100%, in some cases, even more than 100%. Which means not only are they buying the GigaSmart applications for the newer installations, they're going back and retrofitting it into their existing installations, adding more GigaSmart applications. And remember, all of this is done as a common platform where you can have multiple of these applications turned on annually. Not to mention with the problem that the standard switches have, because they're, they're relying on traditional ACLs. So once I match an ACL, that's it. What if you have one flow that has multiple components to it, right? It's, it's a single tap that has web and FTP and, and SMTP and DNS and all that. And you want to split that up between the different tools. Good luck doing it with Big Switch or Arista. You won't be able to. So, so, so those tools don't have the ability to program multiple flows for multiple destination ports. Consider, imagine things like role-based access control. So imagine, things about different, imagine things around different tool groups that need to have different views of the traffic. Yeah. It's extraordinarily difficult to do that. Right. I, I can understand right. how so, that would be difficult. So, so, so discrete traffic. Let's say you want DNS to go to port 1 and mail to go to port 2. You, you'll be able to do that. But if you want to have a port that takes both DNS and say SMTP, and then a different port that will take just SMTP, you won't be able to do that. Because as soon as I have a match, that's it. ACL is done processing. So I, can, I can split my traffic however you want to how many ever tools you want. So if you want a tool that takes everything within, from the same source, one tool takes everything, another tool takes just pieces of it, I can split that traffic however many times you want me to split it or consolidate it. So, so what I'm hearing is that you, you, plan, you plan to differentiate based on your value add and you think that that value add is worth the cost of the extra uh, cabling and, and the, the capex of, of the, the, well I guess I'll, the, the total cost of ownership of having a separate uh, uh, packet broker network of devices. So that value add, so, so if these other solutions continue to add, add capabilities over time, 
um, that start to match your feature set or get closer to your feature set. Um, you know, is that and another? So another part of that is like for us, like I said earlier, my, my environment is kind of static. Maybe I haven't thought through some of the. If I get more dynamic and I start using more of your knobs and I can use them in an automated uh, fashion um, and script against them, making it easier than having to go and do the CLI. Um, maybe I'll have more use cases I can think through. But for me, I have a fairly static environment, and I and we pride ourselves on designing very simple. Our, our, our design should be very simple and straightforward such that it shouldn't be that difficult to get the correct monitoring traffic from the areas that we need because we kind of build our modules in that way, right? Um, so if these other if these other vendors come in at, at almost no cost additional to the, the, the hardware that I'm purchasing for the network and they have so they start to, to, to bridge that gap in feature set, where does that where does that go from there? And then also the second half of that question is with these large virtual environments. You guys have a virtual appliance now, right? That you you're, you're putting this virtual appliance out there. Um, what prevents us from, from using that virtual? The, the virtual world is going to become the, the predominant network and all the east-west traffic. Already, we already have to get a ton of visibility. There's a big visibility gap in the virtual space. So what prevents us from, from using the network for the rudimentary north-south stuff and then all the east-west stuff, the virtual players come in? I mean, so it's, it's a, to me there's a lot of changes going on, and, and, I, and I, I'm just wondering... Are you guys looking to integrate? The real question is, are you looking to integrate more and maybe have blades that go into chassis or things of that nature that go into our current network gear or, or add-ons into our current network gear? Or are you looking to stay a standalone? Okay, so I think there were probably about eight questions in your, <laughs> yeah. your mega question, right? So I'll let us split it up and try to answer as, as many as possible that I can remember. Um, the first of all, remember that when you build a there's always going to be a base set of instrumentation available in any switch or router. That's what's called the span port, right? And that's the nature of it. You've got to have that. And there is value in that. Nobody's saying there's no value in that. But there is a scalability challenge in that, right? So the reason why you've got a separate infrastructure for monitoring is because this infrastructure is getting extraordinarily complex. And anybody who denies that is probably in denial, right? So when you add virtualization, when you add um, layers of complexity, when you look at the complexity of the number of tools that are being used today, it is massive. That's the reason why security, for example, is often becoming the big driver in terms of how people want to kind of remove those layers of complexity and make it more simple to get visibility, right? So at the end of the day, Will there be more capabilities that are added into switches that are repurposed to provide a fraction of these capabilities? Yeah, merchant silicon is going to evolve. And accordingly, the software to use that merchant silicon will also evolve. But at the end of the day, it's completely a stateless device. right? Think about a problem like this. When you're doing pervasive monitoring across multiple locations, so let's just think through what the packet flow is going to look like when traffic goes from a server in this rack to a server in this rack. It hits the top of the rack switch here. It probably goes to a spine switch here, and then goes to um, a leaf switch to the server in this rack. Which means that if you're tapping here, I get a copy of the packet here, between this leaf switch and this spine switch, and I also get another copy of the same packet <coughs> because of the switch, and there's a tap here. And effectively, the visibility infrastructure gets two copies of the packet. Maybe four if you have your virtual appliances in there too. Absolutely. Good, good point, right? So now think about this. If, you got, if you're getting four copies of the packet and you're already worried about tool overload, you just increase it four times, right? So do you think deduplication is optional here in this environment? Absolutely not. Deduplication is absolutely imperative. It's not a niche feature as some vendors would claim. Right. It's an absolutely imperative thing when you're doing pervasive monitoring, right? right? So the point here is that visibility is about understanding blind spots. And by the very nature and definition of a blind spot, you don't know what you're looking for. So your challenges are going to evolve, and you need to have a platform which can evolve with that. Right? So whether it is SSL today, whether it's trying to uh, handle um, uh, scalability of your security appliances tomorrow, whether it's trying to understand SSL, whether it's trying to reduce the traffic with this maybe being in compliance requirements because you don't want to be exposing social security numbers, for example, in any environment, and you certainly don't want to be exposing patient records in a healthcare environment. How do you make sure that you mask off sensitive data and still do be able to do your job? 
to give another example, voice over IP, pretty big ubiquitous in most enterprises today, right? Pretty big voice over IP analysis um, is very easy to find out who is calling whom. Do you really want the voice over IP administrator to be knowing that information? Probably not, because that problem puts it in violation in terms of certain compliance policies, either for the organization or depending on the country or region that they are operating in. So we got technology where the voice over IP administrator that administrator can do their job, which is making sure that the quality of service is provided, but still be in compliance because such sensitive information can be masked out. And I'm not talking about science fiction here. These are things, are capabilities, which our customers use today. So I hope this provides you some, some perspective in terms of why we believe that um, purpose-built solutions are required for this. And I do want to mention one thing, which I don't think we spend too much time on, uh, we have expanded our solution to also run on a white box. This is what you see here, the OS in the white box. So when we were, when we met in um, Tech Field Day in our headquarters last September. year, September, uh, this was not available. So this is something new that we announced earlier this year. Uh, we now can run the GBB OS on uh, Quanta white box and over time we'll expand the support for more uh, third party white boxes. Uh, and of course, the capabilities there would be limited to what the underlying the hardware can support, right? Uh, but exactly the same capabilities is what you have here, which would be flow mapping, the ability to cluster, can actually, can actually be procured and consumed on, uh, by, by our software running on a third party white box as well. But the beauty of this approach is that by using clustering, you can take something which is a fairly you know, commodity third party switch that's got a testing class visibility software and in a homogeneous way tied back to the rest of the visibility functions and still take advantage of all of these in a very, very simple way.